My name is Andy Goodwin, and for those who don't know me, I am the Head of Progression at Long Road Sixth Form College. And today, as part of our Progression Week activities, I am delighted to have a wonderful guest speaker with us. And this is Andrew McKenzie, who is the Managing Director of the uh, Africa and Asia Venture Gap Year Organisation. Andrew, how are you today? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting us. You're welcome, and it's a, it's a delight on, on behalf of us to have you here. Um, Andrew, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch my camera off and pass over to you, if that's okay, and let you deliver your presentation. Right. Let me just... Uh, hang on. Uh, let me just do the sharing. Hi there. Um, as Andy said, uh, my name is Andrew McKenzie. I'm Managing Director of um, African to Asia Venture. Uh, we're known as AV. Now, an apology before um, I get going too much. If you hear a dog barking in the background, that's that's Dougie, our West Highland White Hooter, because I'm I'm doing this from home. So many apologies if you do if you do hear a dog. Um, he won't bite there. Okay. Um, so the name of the company is, if I may, I'm going to just tell you a little bit about us, first of all, then what we do, and then tell you a bit about why we believe people should take a gap year and why really everybody should take a gap year. So I'll, I'll come on to that. Um, so just to deal with us. So as I say, our name is African Asia Venture, but rather annoyingly, we're known as AV as opposed to AAV. And the reason for that is we began life as Africa Venture. And then some years later, we started going to India, Nepal and elsewhere, and we became Africa and Asia Venture, but we retain that logo. So that, that's why we're AV. So just to give you a little bit of background about us, we've been operating since 1993. So we're nearly um, 30 years old. About 6,000 people um, aged 17 to 25 have traveled with us. So we do specialize very specifically in that market. So uh, just for people at that age on their gap year, we also run trips for schools and colleges and things like that. But that's it as far as what we're concerned. Now that 6,000 people though, we have come from over 30 countries. The UK is our largest market for obvious reasons. Uh, the US is actually our second largest market. Um, so just to explain to you a little bit about how we are different from others, because if you were to Google gap year companies and things, you'll find an awful lot of um, operators. Uh, we are what's known as a not-for-profit social enterprise. Uh, so we're, we don't do this to make money. We obviously have to charge for what we do to cover our costs, but any excess income over costs is reinvested in the business. So that's why we are a not-for-profit social enterprise. And we specialize in something called group-based full immersion volunteering, which I'll go into in a, a, a little bit more detail in a moment. Um, and we specialize in working with primary and secondary school children in these communities. But most importantly, uh, we believe that you should live and work in the community that you, to which you travel with us. Um, we believe that you benefit from that experience, and we'll talk about it some more, but, but so does the community. We're different as well because we run our own projects completely. So we, we uh, in country, we have our own people. We don't use other people um, or other organisations. So everything we do, we do ourselves. And then that, when that comes to the marketing and doing the talking and then looking after people and so on, um, we do it as ourselves. Uh, and that means that in country, we have our own 24 seven in country management teams. They won't necessarily be local people, but they will be, if they're not local people, they will be people who have lived in that country for many, many years, 20, 30 plus years. 
Uh, we're also the only organization that offers a period of what we call supported independent travel. What that means is that at the end of our longer projects, and again, I'll talk more about that later, um, which is basically about 12 weeks, there is an option for people to do another four weeks when they can travel wherever, wherever they like in the locality, uh, supported by our people on the ground. Now, when I say they can travel wherever they like, that is obviously within reason, because if the Foreign and Commonwealth Office is advising against travel to a particular area or whatever, you can't go there. And again, we'll talk about more about that in a moment. Um, but at that stage of your time with us, our people on the ground um, can advise on, you know, where to go, where to stay, how to get there, where not to go, where not to stay. And most importantly is if things do go wrong, they're there to help sort it out. But otherwise you are traveling on your, have the benefit of traveling entirely on, on your own. In reality, um, our groups are fairly small, between four and eight probably. And as a result, they actually tend to travel at this stage altogether. Um, but supported, as I say, by our people. And uh, as it says at the bottom of the screen, we, we don't have more than 100 per annum traveling with us. Obviously, at the current time, things are very, very different. We have nowhere near 100. Um, but even in the, should we say, the good old days, we didn't have more than 100 travel with us, which did mean, does mean, that we can get to know the people who travel with us very well because we will spend a lot of time with them before they go preparing them for their time uh, then of course they're in country but also we do quite a lot of debriefing when they come back so we like to think that small really is beautiful in this situation um, everything we do though we believe is about traveling with a purpose so we want people to travel not just to, to see things that are different and experience things are different, but actually to get to understand it, get to know it better. And these pictures, the top uh, lot of pictures, well, well, sorry, all of these were taken by a girl, girl called Anna Walker who traveled with us. And the top ones, the typical touristy ones uh, that she took when she was on her travels backpacking. And then the bottom ones are when she was actually living and working in the community in Kenya. And, uh, we would argue that by spending time in that community, you get to know them so much better. You're not just a backpacker passing through. In terms of what people do on our projects, everything, as I said earlier, we do is with primary and secondary school kids. The reason for that is that we are taking the, the people who are traveling with us please don't take this the wrong way, but they're young, unskilled, unqualified, but enthusiastic young people. And uh, it is our view though, that they can make a contribution to these communities, a real contribution. And that contribution can best be made with the kids in those communities. All of these communities, uh, all of them do benefit uh, from tourism. So by that, I mean that if we can help these children to read and write English better, that is something that really can help improve their life chances. It's as simple as that. So that's what we try to do. Um, it is our view, therefore, that you know life is a, a two way street. And if you can go out there and help them, that experience in itself, I promise you, will help you. And again, we're, we're going to go into that a bit more. Um, but this is really getting stuck into the local community. It is slightly off the beaten track, uh, but it is a, an experience that will enable you to put on your CV something which is very different. And again, we'll talk some more about that in a moment, about how important that is these days. So um, why 
take a gap year. I mean, as I said at the beginning, we, and I know I would say this, wouldn't I? Um, but I believe it devoutly. I think every young person should take a gap year. I really do. Um, it is a window of opportunity in your life that will close. So this is a time in your life um, when you won't necessarily have many responsibilities, when you can be footloose and fancy free, and when you can get out there, see things and enjoy them and do it for a meaningful period. That is something, um, a time in your life that will close because after university or whatever, you will find yourself getting into jobs, relationships, financial commitments, one thing or another, and actually to take a meaningful period of time out of the, the so-called you know, mainstream of life, uh, it, it just won't be possible. Um, and that's why we think it's a great time to do something different, go somewhere different, be somewhere different, um, but most importantly, get out of your comfort zone. But it is very important to understand that it, that we say a gap year is not a year off, it's a year out. So it actually is still very much an educational experience. It's just you're not in formal education. You're going to be learning on the job, teaching yourself, learning a lot about yourself. Now, a lot of people, when, well, I think I said to you, when, when um, people come back, we debrief them on how they've got on so that we can learn how to improve and so on. But one of the thing, one of the, the prime questions for us is to ask these people, what have you got out of this experience? And it's that word confidence, which I say comes up the most often without a doubt so to to, to learn that sort of self-confidence at this stage is terribly important and can give you a great leg up as you go forward in life just a brief anecdote a, a, a girl who came with us uh, this is a few years ago now um, she was very shy she she wasn't even sure that she really wanted to travel with us. She didn't know that she'd be capable of doing it. But anyway, she did. She came back and she had matured hugely. And she wrote afterwards to say that after her time with AV, she felt that she could deal with anything that life threw at her because she now had that self-confidence. And I feel that that is a fantastic um, attribute to have at that age as you go into university and then on into life. But there are these other things as well. So um, AV is, is really a great big initiative test for us. So because you are living and working in the community, we are not, this is not like a school or college trip. So we are not there, our people are not managing you. Uh, you are going into the school uh, to work with the children, but we are not there telling you what to do and when to be there and so on. So you have to use your initiative um, and take responsibility and be accountable. Uh, and that's why AV, the AV experience is really nothing more than an, an initiative test. Um, one of the reasons for that is that the, um, the, the biggest value that people who travel with us can add to the community, probably, is on the extracurricular front. So working in the community as a teaching assistant in class, helping these kids with English or other academic subjects and other things, but it's actually, as I say, on the extracurricular front. So these communities, these schools will have very, very limited facilities. So if you want to get involved with other things afterwards, like art or dance, drama, music, sport in particular, the kids will love it because they don't get it normally. Um, but what that means is that you will have to organise it. So don't expect somebody else to provide 
facilities or whatever, you have got to go out and do it. One quick story, we had a girl who was going on to do art at art school. And so therefore she wanted to do art. When she got out to Uganda, she discovered that there was, um, for what she wanted to do, there was insufficient paper, there were no paints, there were no crayons, nothing like that. She went to the, um, the local market, she bought some recycled paper, very basic paper. She couldn't find any pens, crayons, anything like that. So she bought some charcoal and she took this back to the school and then in the afternoon the children uh, and, and there were far more children turned up than she had anticipated and they ended up using the charcoal on their hands and sort of doing hand paintings and things like that and uh, they then built a mural with with all these pictures and it was an experience for this for this girl that taught her that actually she was capable of organizing and doing much more than she thought she was capable of and at the same time the children had a whale of a time. So that's why these sort of skills can be generated through this sort of experience, through having put yourself outside your comfort zone and got yourself, getting yourself doing things that you might not normally do in a different community. So all of those skills we believe are invaluable as you go out into life. Um, I think it's also yeah. worth saying another reason for why you should take a gap year is that life for you guys, I'm sorry to say, is very, very competitive. I think it's never been more competitive. Um, now, I don't know whether these stats are right up to date, but they certainly were true. Um, a year or two ago, and that is that 60% of graduates are coming out of university with a first or two one. Um, and then the, the next one is, is quite staggering as well. Employers have eight seconds to read a CV, eight seconds. So they're not going to get to the bottom of page two or page three or page four or whatever. So therefore, you've got to be able to convey something special about you very quickly um, and as we were told by somebody who traveled with us, um, you, you've got to put it right near the top of your CV and something that really catches the eye. Um, now, th and this last uh, stat as well, this was true last summer. I don't know whether it's still true now. I, I see no reason why it shouldn't be. But there are, there are 100 graduates for every graduate vacancy. Um, now, Harvard University, which by many people's reckoning is one of the top, if not the top university in the world, it is interesting that Harvard writes to each of its freshmen to suggest that they should take a gap year before they go to university. Now, uh, they, don't, they don't have to, I hasten to add, and not all do, but very many do. I would argue that if Harvard thinks it's a good idea, every university should think it's a good idea uh, and I'm, I'm confident most employers would but I'm not confident that every UK university would agree with me on that which is very sad and I think that's because they want bums on seat they want you in there um, paying your nine thousand pounds a year or whatever it is so if Harvard think it's good enough I think it is good enough um, but uh, it, 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 you, you, there can be good um, gap years and there can be bad gap years. So by that, I mean, if you use the time well, use it productively, gain some really good experience to put on your CV, then um, that is a good idea. If you just sit at home watching Netflix or whatever, that ain't going to go down too well. Surprise, surprise. Some of the larger employers these days even have as part of your application process asking if you did take a gap year and you can score positive points and you can score negative points. So please do use it. Do something different.
And when you get to the stage where you're applying for these jobs, you get these really awful standard questions about describe a complex problem you have faced and how did you deal with it and so on and so on and so forth. And these are very standard questions. And so to have some experience that enables you to answer those questions in a different way is fantastic. So if I can just get, I'm going to give you two quick examples, um, which were, were used both in answer to questions like this, but also actually in interviews for internships. Um, so we had a, a young man called Rory. Um, he was in Malawi. Uh, he had applied for an internship along with a lot of his mates. Um, not none of his friends got inv in, invited for the interview, but he did. And and this this was him explaining to us after the event. I hasten to add that this is how we know the story. Um, that he went for the interview and he had put at a very prominent place in his CV that when he was in Malawi, he and the other two or three in his group had actually run this school in Malawi for a few days because the teachers were on strike. It sounds much better than, you know, what actually happened, but it was true. So when he went for his interview, uh, the very first question was, what's all this about Malawi? And he then spent... 40 minutes uh, taking questions, talking about his time in Malawi. They never once said to him, tell us about your course. Why do you want to join us? Why do you want to become uh, a chartered accountant or whatever it was? Um, so the, the, the whole conversation was targeted on something that the interview interviewers knew nothing about and were fascinated by. They found it an interesting half hour or whatever. The long and the short of that was that he did get uh, an offer for his internship and that then led on to um, other things. And actually, 10 years later, he's still with that organisation. And the other one was um, a girl who travelled with us. She um, wanted to play netball. Uh, she said to the children in class, anyone want to play netball this afternoon? A few hands went up. When she turned up at 2.30 that afternoon, there were about 80 kids there all wanting to play. They'd heard um, they'd heard ball as football. So there were lots of boys there as well. Everybody wanting to play football. And she had to manage the situation. She split them up into teams and groups and had them doing various you know, exercises and all sorts of things. And, and then some of them playing the game. And that actually then went on for several days afterwards because they enjoyed it so much. But she used that uh, later on in life when she was going for jobs and things, explaining how she had learnt to use her initiative and deal with different situations um, in, in you know, different ways. And I think if you can have stories like that to tell people, it makes you stand out from the pack. It's no good, I'm afraid, these days, just saying you've done D of E gold or whatever, because so many others have. You've got to have something different. OK, so just before I um, get to the end, I just wanted to give two absolute must travel tips for you. W whatever you're doing, wherever you're going, um, and this isn't uh, necessarily specifically limited to gap years either. The, the first thing is be sure to have comprehensive medical and travel insurance. Now, I know that's stating the obvious, but Quite often what will happen is people will uh, take out their insurance, but they might then extend their travels and they will neglect to extend their travel insurance cover. OK, so if you do go away and then you decide to stay a few extra weeks, or whatever, don't forget to make sure that you extend your cover because insurers will freak out of anything. So. Uh, that's really important. The second thing is do keep an eye um, on the um, Foreign and Commonwealth Office uh, uh, travel advice pages. Um, the obvious thing there is because, of course, they'll tell you, they'll advise uh, um, on what's going on in any particular area or whatever. But actually, it also links back to the insurance 
issue because if you travel into an area that the foreign office is advising against travel to uh, if you do do that and you go in and then something happens your insurance will be invalidated okay so it's terribly important that you keep an eye on what the advice is for, for those two reasons. So please, 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 it's very easily done, but we have heard of many cases where I'm afraid people get carried away in the moment and they forget to do it. Um, then just quickly, if you do decide to take a gap year, um, just some advice on, on the best way to go about how you decide who to travel with. The, the, the first and obvious thing is please do um, talk to your family and friends and contacts. Uh, if you can get word of mouth advice, we still think that that's very powerful. Yes, you can read online reviews and all the rest of it, but, but far better to, to find out people who you know and whose views you respect. The, your careers library um, at college, I'm sure, will be very helpful as well. Um, there are some very good online review facilities as well. Um, you, as an example, you can check us, uh, check our Google reviews and, and there's a website called GoOverseas.com, which is a, a, a big source of gap year options. And uh, we have 50 or 60 reviews or something like that. And so most, most good companies will have that. Um, but most importantly, if you, when you decide to travel with a particular company or whatever, uh, do ask them if you can actually speak to somebody who has traveled with them. And we would prefer it if you actually spoke to them, don't just do it by text, actually talk to them and find out about their experience with the company concerned. And the best question, it may sound odd, but the best question to ask is what was the worst experience on the trip? Not the best, because the, the best they can just sort of say quickly and it was all fantastic. Honestly. But if they say, no, no, it all worked perfectly, it, it actually opens up the conversation. So we know something must have gone wrong. Maybe you lost a suitcase. Maybe you uh, had an upset stomach. I don't know. Something. So try and open up the conversation that, that way and find out what was the worst aspect of the trip. Get, get an answer to that question. OK, so I hope that's helpful. Um, I hope I haven't gone on too long. Um, my name has been Andrew McKenzie. The company, as I say, is Africa and Asia Venture. Our handle on uh, Instagram is Africa Asia Venture. YouTube, our YouTube channel is Africa Asia Venture. There's our website. Um, Andy and Emma, I think, have got all the details. And I think with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, if that's OK, Andy. That sounds great. Thank you very much, Andrew. That's really good. Um, I'm just going to change the view on screen there so that people can see. There we go. They can see us both. Um, Andrew, that was really insightful and some great advice and tips at the end there. Um, I, I guess, well, one of the questions that's come through, this is from someone called Julie, um, was that could you give the students who are thinking about doing this next year what your current views are given COVID restrictions and how that might be impacting on what's going on? Uh, very good question <laughs> and quite difficult to answer. Sure. Um, obviously, uh, if you just look at Portugal recently and, and how quickly travel advice can change, it is jolly difficult to say. All, all I would say is that the beginning of this year we did have people in Kenya. Kenya is actually now on the red list so we can't do it but earlier this year it wasn't on the red list and we were able to send people there and I should also say that I don't know if you remember but there was advice against all but essential travel but are we qualify for an exemption because we are run, running volunteering programs so people can travel with us um, provided of course the 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 the, the, we can get to the country that we want to go to. So the, the answer to your question was that the only country we could go to this year was Kenya. We are optimistic that things will be better um, come January. 
So for us, a, a major departure time is January. So a lot of people leaving college in July, whatever, may then work for a few months and then travel with us in January. So we are hoping that we will be running at least some of our programmes come January. We may actually even have some in September. OK, if I can just follow up on that a little bit and, and use the same analogy that you did about Portugal. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, because the Portugal announcement was last minute, prior to that announcement, some people had arranged to go on holiday. And then the announcement came. And so they had a very fast deadline in which to get out of Portugal. Otherwise, they were going to um, have to go into isolation, etc. So if any of our students join AV, go ab abroad, for example, somewhere like Kenya, and an, an announcement is then made that says you shouldn't be in that country, you've got until this date. What happens then? Do the students get left there to work it out whilst they're there? Do you offer them support in terms of bringing them home early? Do they have yeah. to pay for that themselves? How, how does that work? Yeah. Um, well, that, again, that's a very good question. So with Kenya this year, that wasn't a problem because... Uh, Kenya was not on the red list at that stage okay. so people um, could travel um, uh, they could travel out there legally and they could get home um, uh, uh, on the scheduled time if you see what I mean so that wasn't a problem what we have been saying to people is that uh, we we do we will help facilitate their return journey and actually the airlines and we, we, we are not allowed by for legal reasons we are not allowed to book flights for people or take money off them for flights so we work with a travel agent and what what has happened in previous situations as well when for whatever reasons people might have had to leave early is flights uh, can normally be switched okay. uh, for them to come home there might be a small fee for changing the flight home when I say smaller, that might be 150 quid or something. I'm afraid I don't know. And yes, what we have done is then rebated a prorated amount of uh, what they have paid us for their for their time with us. OK, good. So, I mean, the important thing, obviously, here is about students wanting to feel safe and looked after and that they're not just going to be isolated and left to fight for yes. themselves sort of thing. Yeah. And, and it sounds I, like you've got that all sorted. Yeah. And I, I think actually that's a good point there, Andy. I think it's, again, I know I would say this, wouldn't I? But I actually think it is a, it, it, it's times like this when actually travelling under the umbrella of an organisation is a good idea. If you're just out there on your own, you don't know where to go, who to turn to and so on. I, I, I think, um, you know, looking at a very basic risk analysis, that's not such a sensible way to travel. No, no. no. So we, we are, if you like, we, we see ourselves as a catalyst, a facilitator, and an insurance policy, almost. I think you do a great job, Andrew. Um, there aren't any other questions at the moment that have come through. Um, if any follow on, I will absolutely send them on to you guys. Um, but all that remains for me to th then say is a huge thank you um, for your talk today. Uh, and I'm sure there'll be lots of people who will be watching this and maybe sparking some inspiration to you know, pursue some gap year activity next year. Great. Well, th thanks again for inviting us. You're welcome.